All right, let's get started. All right, so afternoon, everybody. I'm Ryan John Keats, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about creating the characters for Hand of Fate. Uh, I'm going to be covering Hand of Fate 1 uh, and 2, which isn't out yet. And I'm going to be talking about some uh, processes that hopefully you can apply to uh, your own games and some tips uh, for that. Uh, because it's not just about making an individual character good, it's, it's about making characters for production. So I'm going to cover some art direction stuff, some concept art, and some modeling. Even though I only do the um, character stuff, I'll talk about how that stuff also uh, influences me in my day-to-day -day work. So I'll start by actually showing you guys uh, the Hand of Fate 2 trailer, if you're not familiar. It's a card game that comes to life. Uh, but this is about the art, so the gameplay is not too specific. The Empire spreads its influence, exporting civilization and rationalism to the fringes of the known world. The northern clans retreat before them, falling back into the mountains. Yet the heart of the Empire is rotted and impure, filled with the corruption and the spreading influence of crime lords and assassins. All of the pieces are in place, and the game begins anew. For I have come for my revenge. Alright, so in Hand of Fate 1, I created all the characters, um, and then most of the weapons, accessories, and uh, other props. And Hand of Fate 2, it's a similar thing, but only now we've got some uh, other character artists, and we've also uh, got some outsourcing. So uh, it seemed to work for me pretty efficiently, so hopefully it can, uh, can work for you guys. So I want to show you a bit of my own work. Well, first, oh yeah, sorry, I'll go back a bit. This is just showing uh, some images from Hand of Fate. So Hand of Fate 2, some splash art, and then some uh, screenshots. As you can see, our environments done by uh, Ben Cooper are really pretty solid. Um, and yeah, everything's still in production, but going smoothly. All right, so I wanted to show you a bit of uh, my own art, just to show that the stuff in Hand of Fate, uh, it's very specific. It is its own art style determined by the art director and the concept artist and me working together. It's not just my innate style and just running off by myself. Uh, so I prefer to work a lot in realism uh, because I feel like it's a strong foundational skill. So I practice as much in realism as I can, uh, because your realism will always influence your stylization. So a strong st understanding of anatomy is translatable. However, being really good at stylization won't help you the other way uh, around. You'll get more refined, but it's just not uh, as broad. So I feel like uh, studying realism is great for, for having broad skills. So just a few more of my own stuff. All right, so Hand of Fate 1 and 2 characters. Uh, the main difference between the two is the texturing style. Hand of Fate 1 uses baked lighting, um, and Hand of Fate 2 uses PBR. And the struggle with that is uh, in PBR, everything is light-based, so you can't cover stuff up with your textures. So your sculptures need to be very succinct, and your textures need to be very uh, specific to them, whilst in Hand of Fate 1, it's more of a painting. Um, which is much uh, easier to do. Uh, Hand of Fate 2 also has much more polygons, uh, which means we can have a lot more secondary motion in our animations and generally just have more uh, detailed characters. Uh, Hand of Fate 2 also has a more refined art style, um, but that's kind of subtle. This is uh, one of the characters from Hand of Fate 1. Uh, I must say, though, these have some dramatic lighting, so you probably won't see a big difference between the Hand of Fate 1 and 2 but it's, uh, it's pretty significant when it comes to the game and the engines. And the Hand of Fate 2 working in PBR is much more friendly for the overall uh, production, uh, specifically in lighting. This is again Hand of Fate 1. This one doesn't have uh, lighting on it, so all that shading that you see, that is all baked into the model, whilst uh, Hand of Fate 2 with PBR, it's very, very flat, uh, so it's not artistic to look at or pretty to look at when, it doesn't, when it's not in a uh, game environment with lighting on it. Uh, again, Hand of Fate 1, that's from some uh, DLC. And this is a Hand of Fate 2 character. Uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a lot less uh, painterly, a lot more, uh, I don't know, it's got a lot more, bit more stylization, I feel. 
uh, it's a bit more specific uh, and a little bit more detailed too. All right, so the pipeline uh, overview. Uh, Define is very compartmentalized in its process, uh, which keeps things pretty uh, efficient and easy to manage. Uh, so progression is very uh, defined. So it begins with uh, our designers. They come up with the characters. They might come up with a list uh, and some specifications and some general ideas of what they think the character should be. And then that gets sent to the uh, art director who has kind of the final say on how the, uh, the character should look. And the art director and the concept artist go back and forth a lot until they get the very specific design. Um, and because our concepts are very strictly adhered to, um, there is little uh, management once I get given a, a concept art. Pretty much all, the, all that back and forth goes between the art, art director and the concept artist. And as long as we've had that initial integration into the style and understand what the in, uh, intention is for the characters, it's very simple once I get a concept to just take that foot through the whole process and then at some intervals just check with the uh, art director. And usually it's just you know simple stuff like, I'll oh, change that color, that character's got a bit too much expression or something like that, just um, pretty basic stuff. Um, our asset pipeline is uh, very much based on sculpting. So ZBrush is my tool, uh, but if I was to be integrating somebody into our process, all I would say is that you need to have basic polygon modeling skills, uh, so you know, uh, basic my or max skills, uh, low poly models, UV texturing, and uh, yeah, just that whole process down and then also some uh, sculpture because the sculpture is really the, the one unique thing and that goes throughout the process. That, that's very influential in all parts. So as far as the high poly model goes, I'll begin by sculpting the body, which is the physique of the character. That's like a, you know, the man or the woman or the goblin or whatever it is, just its raw, you know, naked form. And then I'll extract the clothes and then anything that's like kind of form fitting and just pull them into the shape. And then I'll mock up any accessories and hard surface details. And that's just uh, based on the concept, just real like rough block outs of where that would be because all of this informs the shape of the character and the, the silhouette. So um, that, that's all roughed out. And then I'll look at the concept, look at what I have and just push everything to just be more accurate. And then I'll go back to those accessories and uh, rebuild them in my or Max or whatever process that individual um, accessory might need. And then I do a final pass, which is a refinement of uh, sculpting hair or, or face or even in the armor, just scratches. Any, anything kind of like a last level uh, refinement is done then. So the timeline for a hand of fake characters is usually one to two weeks, uh, which is three to five days of high poly modeling and sculpting, one to two days of low poly modeling, one to two of UV and texturing. Um, for somebody that's new or starting, I'd say that that's uh, about two to three weeks. Uh, but as you work more and you get more comfortable with the process, you'll get faster. And I'd definitely say, you know, once doing this stuff, take as much time as you possibly can initially. And once you've got what you want, then you find ways to make it fast. Uh, it's all, I think it's all about getting the best possible result you can and then bringing it back from there and then thinking about efficiency. Uh, but definitely starting with like, how can I make this as best as I possibly can? Um, from a concept and design point of view, I have to say hard surface details definitely take more time than organic parts, and less parts means less time. So uh, monsters are much quicker than a knight, even if the designs are just as grandiose, just as uh, awesome looking, um, like a minotaur or an ogre or anything like that is usually much quicker than a full plate knight um, because of all the, the hard surface stuff. Um, so the timeline I created, the one that I just talked about, that was all about uh, looking at the game view, so the, the view that you see the characters in the game and then determining how I can make the best uh, results for that without spending more time than I need to. Uh, so there was a time when I was playing around with hair cards and, and all these other processes uh, that were great, but it just wasn't necessary. Uh, so I kind of toned it back. And then again, when, you have, when you're working to a very specific concept, there's no real need to uh, take longer than necessary because once you've got those shapes there, you've got them there. You don't need to refine them over and over and over again, uh, particularly if you're not going to see that. So there's that same character. This is a, a render and substance painter, I should say. So um, yeah, that's, that's that. And then uh, 
this is that concept for that same design. So for interpreting concepts, anything that you don't see on the concept, uh, studying realism is, is usually the best way to, to go about filling in those blanks. Like I can know exactly how, the, how his back is going to be, um, you know, from, from knowing generally what backs are sculpted like. And then even the, the back uh, equipment and stuff, the way that lies on the body is, again, from the foundation of what the body looks like underneath. So I find sculpture is a better alternative to polygon modeling uh, just because you it's so fast that you're always uh, interpreting and making decisions really quickly. Well, so if I was polygon modeling any of this, uh, I'd kind of be like doing it once and then trying to fix it as opposed to so with sculpting, I'm kind of just fixing it uh, on the go. I'll have to have, also have to say about concepts. Um, I keep very close to the concept. So even the cloth sculpting, uh, sculpting is uh, stylized based on what I see in the concept. So I kind of try to build that because um, uh, a, lo a lot of people get confused and they try to make a realistic uh, cloth. Um, but I find it's easy to base it on the concepts. Um, and then since the characters are stylized, uh, any buckles or ropes or any small accessories are usually made for that specific model. It, it would be good to be able to transfer them across models, but they are all uh, they will kind of help shape the overall form. So having something that's a little bit too big or a little bit too small does change uh, the stylization. So I want to go on to the actual concept art styles that we work from. So firstly, I'll, I'll say that this, this is a, a good example of, of the kind of uh, concept that we are given. Um, and this is, you know, that uh, rendered version of that same model. So I'll just go back quickly to show you that you can see it's all pretty similar. All right, so this is the rendered concept art style that we get essentially. Uh, this is usually to indicate the uh, intended, like the perfect uh, result of what, what they want to see in the game. And um, so it influences your textures, your sculpting, like the cloth sculpting. Um, it pretty much uh, in influences everything. It's like I said, the in intended final uh, result. Um, but it's usually reserved for presentation and pitches once somebody is integrated into the process. So once you know what the materials should look like, what the folds should look like, you really don't need to uh, have the concept artist spend all the time to be painting uh, it over because you can spend as much time as you would be modeling. So what we realistically work with once we are integrated into the process uh, is, is the line art. Um, because we work so specifically to the concept, the line art is uh, ideal because it's very hard to uh, have any mistakes with it. We can, we can get, get this and we can just design it. Um, it's not affected by light, lighting and shadows and uh, the colors are flat like a, uh, a key, like a, like a chart key. Um, as far as the materials, uh, we have a bit of freedom to, to kind of uh, create what feels right um, because the characters are so small that uh, you know, it doesn't really matter if we have the fabrics perfect to it because you know, it's just not necessary. They're, they're not really seen in a cinematic lighting. Um, and like I said, it's minimal direction is needed once we have that. And uh, the concepts are usually done in the one angle with some uh, back views and accessory views if ever needed. So I wanna show you how we do some weapons because uh, it's kind of like a quick way of showing the whole process. Uh, but the weapons and accessories are also designed in a way that is really quick and efficient. Uh, essentially, we get concept art like this, which means in Maya or 3D Max, I can essentially just trace the model and go through the whole process really quickly. Uh, that way, we can, uh, in Hand of Fate, we can crank out to you know two to three uh, weapons a day sometimes. Um, so this is the concepts that we're given with the renders. Um, obviously, we don't need the full rendering, but it, everything uh, does help. So this is uh, my Maya modeling of the weapons. Uh, this one has a, has a sculpture pass. They'll all have sculpture uh, passes, but as you can see, it's pre pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, and then this is them in Substance Painter once they have textures. Uh, as for the details, they are pretty much painted in uh, on the ZBrush model and then just extracted in. So all those details, they're just literally a painting uh, that can be done in Photoshop or you know, it doesn't even have to be painted, but that's how we get those uh, extra details. Uh, this is another uh, 
image where the one on the left is the concept and then the one on the right is the uh, game ready model. So sculpture, uh, like I was saying, sculpture is the cornerstone of uh, this process. Um, and the reason for that is when I create a character, it's all about that underlying physique of the, the character, which everything else is uh, built on top of it. Kind of, it's, it's kind of the framework of everything. Uh, my personal process is to create the landmarks really early and then move it into proportion. So I like create loose arms, shoulders, muscles, and then, then build into proportion as opposed to traditional sculpture, which is to have those proportions established early on. Um, and I just do that because to make use of the full like digital flexibility and I find it goes really fast. Um, so what I want to talk about now is the extracting. So I'll give a little demonstration of, of how um, I might make a helmet extracting it from the underlying form. So I begin just like I was telling you with those weapons where I painted on the details. Here I'm painting on a mask uh, of this is not a helmet from Hand of Fate, I just did it for this um, example. And I, I kind of painted like a basic Greek helmet shape. Then I extracted it and just used different uh, tools to re-topologize uh, it. Not, not manually, just auto re-topologizing it just to smooth everything out and get those shapes. And I just kept on pulling it and looking at the, the concepts and pulling and pushing it. And it's very, uh, it's not that complicated when you see it in this kind of basic step-by-step uh, -step process. Uh, this is the process I use for low poly modeling and also for hard surface modeling, which is to build a mesh on top of uh, the geometry that I have. Um, and this is using a program called Topogon. There's lots of different ways to do it, um, but that's the way that, that I do it. Uh, so here is the helmet again. It's essentially as though I built it up in Maya, but I have that sculptural foundation to get everything done quick and in proportion. And here what I've done is that I've extruded it and then I've gone and created edge loops around the um, sharp points so that it'll be hard surface. And then that's what it would uh, look like. And then if I was to add any details, I just you know, paint it on or, or do that same process again of sculpting it and then sharpening edges. But from here, I can push those details in, I can extract them out, I can, I can uh, do a lot from there. Uh, so one of the things I've got to say about hard surface is I feel like the key to stylization with hard surface, so I'll just go back, is uh, to have fall off, which is the smoothness of the edges. The, the, the more cartoony I want a uh, um, hard surface, the, the more I'll round off the edges. I just think that's like a small little uh, tip that, that's kind of handy. Um, and as for the processes, it's either the, the process that I've shown you of building up uh, the, the uh, low poly like it's a single plane or just um, sculpting a, a model and then retopologizing the entire thing and just pu uh, putting uh, poly pushing and then uh, making those edges sharp. So one of the other things is we keep in Hand of Fate 2, we keep all the hard surface objects very clean and flat. We don't add any details. We add that in our substance painter as a texturing pass and we use height maps and other things to give it that uh, grainy grain for like metal or anything like that. If we were to create scratches and, and metal flakes and stuff on the hard surface, we'd, like what we used to do in Hand of Fate 1, um, then when we take it into Substance Painter, it tends to layer up and just get muddy. So that's one of the processes we've changed. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. This is a little out of order. Um, so this is just showing you that with the final result that you put in your game is your low poly model and the textures assigned to it. So a lot of people get carried away with the sculpture and kind of forget that that's not what's going in the game. What's going in the game is low poly. So you really have to be thinking about it, uh, particularly with something like hair. Don't create too many strands. They've all got to... Uh, be built for the low poly model, so you've got to be aware of your poly counts and things like that. Um, this image is to kind of show you that uh, you, you have to choose where to merge things into the model and when to have it as a separate uh, chunk of geometry and when to just have something as a texture. Like you can see those strips of uh, the pattern along his uh, stomach are, you know, just baked in as textures, but then those, um, the uh, ribbons down the chest are have their own geometry to accommodate for that shape. And then something like the buckle is not merged. It's a completely separate part. 
Um, one of the ways I create the low poly models is I smooth out my sculpture. Uh, the reason for doing that is to um, take away, to, so I'm not distracted by other details, because it's very easy for me to, uh, on this sculpture, for example, follow those lines, uh, but that would just kind of uh, get in the way. So I smooth out the details so I can highlight exactly where I should be adding detail and where I should not for the low poly model. Um, one of the things we do in ZBrush is we assign everything a material ID, um, and that's when we give everything a flat color so that we can color pick those uh, as materials when we take it into our texturing program, which we use as a substance painter. And that, that's, a, that's the example of that. Um, the reason being is that once we have those materials separated, uh, we can swap it very easily. So there it's the sa literally the same model, but because we have things like height maps, um, we can create essentially a completely different looking uh, object and, and completely change the textures as long as we have those regions uh, isolated. Uh, one of the tips to Substance Painter, if you're familiar with it, is to create smart materials where you have multiple layers of textures which uh, you can um, save out and then apply to different models. So we can have uh, you know, seven different characters of the same um, uh, class or, or you know, they, they might be seven Viking type characters and then they all have the same metal and we can just save that out and just slap it on there and we can get it done uh, really quickly. All right, so when it comes to outsourcing, I find the best uh, process is to actually give the people one of the models. It all depends on your NDAs and what you're comfortable with uh, sending somebody. But I find when somebody has the an exact example of the style that they're going for, it's much easier for them to uh, accommodate that to get it to very, you know to have the the faceting of on of details on the face to have uh, the cloth folded in a certain way. Um, they have the perfect example there, and just giving them as much material as possible and as much communication as possible uh, is best, I find, with that. So now I want to show you a demonstration of um, creating the thief character that we've got for Hand of Fate uh, and also some of the things we've done for efficiency. So this is one of our Empire characters and I should start by saying that uh, a lot of our characters are on a, uh, a couple of different rigs but uh, any that are on the same rig, we have to keep their joint placement the same. Um, and one of the benefits of that is we can get them uh, rigged and skinned very quickly. Uh, also things like hands, um, we can actually keep the low poly models from that and just uh, keep using that over and over. And that would save a lot of time. So in creating the thief, I would take one of the models of the same rig proportions, such as this empire character, and then strip it down. As you can see, it's not a particularly natural looking shape. And the reason for that being is that the concept art um, has the very layered midriffs with all this kind of equipment, um, which, is, which is fine, but it's just not realistic. So you have to kind of build it with all that stuff um, in mind. So with this one, I took them and I stripped them down to what was uh, needed. And then I started editing that for to uh, accommodate the, the concept art. So everything is, is changed a little bit except for the hands. So even the arms are a little skinnier, a little different shapes, the face, it's a new face, um, and the uh, body proportions are, are designed to, to fit the concept. Then I add a couple more of those uh, details as, as separate parts. Um, at this point, I would start to doing that uh, retopology uh, re process, the one I was showing you with the uh, helmet. So that's how I get that, that waist uh, cloth. And then again with um, those shoulder cloths and the details coming down the, the chest. You can also see I've added a, a bit more uh, detail to the face. A um, bit more sculpting, some tube tubes that I've put down to create that pattern on the chest on it. Just a close-up of all that. You can see on the uh, arms there that uh, even the, the cloth is kind of faceted uh, just to stick with the style. You, yeah, even, even those um, like ribbon shapes on, on their chest are, uh, have, have a bit of a faceted uh, shape to their design. 
This is me applying those material ideas so that I can color pick them when I'm in Substance Painter. Uh, I do create two models of this. The one has everything flat colors and the other has the organic colors uh, painted. And I prefer to paint that in ZBrush just because I find that if I don't do that, uh, I can get a lot of different layers in uh, Substance Painter just by having all sorts of freckles and all those little small nuances will, will really build up. Uh, also, any like the reason there's no leg and arm is because uh, to save UV space um, with the textures, I, I just do it once and I uh, mirror it across, so I don't have to do it. Uh, don't have to take up all the space. Um, here's my low poly model. Like I was showing you before, I just built it. My low poly model is just built directly on top of my uh, sculpture, and I've just got to plan ahead as to what I want as separate chunks of geometry. And there's just an example of how I'd build that stuff up. And here it shows the normal maps with that geometry. Here is the uh, flat texture, so that, that doesn't have any, that's just the material ID. Again, the material ID. And this is the uh, final substance painter uh, result. So my material IDs I, I keep pretty close to the actual colors because um, it's just easy to get the colors closer when they're already there. Here are my uh, UV maps. So anything that's double-sided, I tend to uh, minimize the UV shell that is not seen. So if you have these like uh, those uh, kind of like skirt shape, the inner shape is still has geometry, but I'll take those shells of UVs and make them, you know, you know, much, much, much smaller um, and stuff like the head just much bigger. I just try to be as uh, optimize my UVs uh, as much as possible so that whatever you're seeing is what gets, uh, gets the most UVs. I also tend to do it uh, top down so your head has the most and your feet should have the least. And that's the same with um, your geometry, the head should have the most geometry and it goes down because that's, that's where there is focus. Uh, even in Hand of Fate where the characters are very small, I do like to put a lot of personality into the faces just because I feel like whenever people do see it, that's what they latch onto. They, they latch onto the, that, that kind of uh, part of it and it kind of gives a personality uh, for the viewer to, to feel. And now this is the, the character rendered. And now one of the interesting things about this is this isn't a character uh, in the game. It's the base of a character in the game, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So, some more renders. And this is, sorry, this is the final low poly model. All right, so when I said this isn't a character in the game, this is one of the things we have done for efficiency in Hand of Fates, um, is the Thieves we use that as a base body, and then we have another set of uh, models and, and a texture sheet that we put on top of it to create the characters. So if we're gonna have four thieves, we would rather have four of that base model I'd made and just give them these outfits that you put on top of them as opposed to making everything from scratch. And if we customize it in the right way, it's, uh, it's not very noticeable. And essentially you're cutting at least half the time with that character. You can't do it for every character in a, in a process, but you can, uh, you know, you can find the places to do it and it can be very effective. So the character I showed you is not, in the, not a character in the game, but simply the underlying figure for these two. So there it is again. And then that's the uh, equipment added on to make the uh, Molotov uh, thief. And just, just a detail. I often will separate uh, the file into separate files if I need to be detailing a specific part just to make it easier for myself. So this is the boot on its own. And then that is the guy in Substance Painter. And then here's just some renders of him. And now this is the Duelist Thief, which again, just a couple more uh, accessories. Uh, it's not really any different to building an armor for the player character in the way that we've approached uh, the thieves. So Substance Painter renders, and then some uh, presentation renders. And then this is finally uh, two of the thieves in the game. That's the Duelist and don't know the name of the other one. 
uh, can start playing a character in the game. Um, and that's just a little thing that uh, all this, most of the sculpting stuff is, is skill based. Um, so it's a lot of late nights of practice. So if you're up, <coughs> up for it, uh, give it a go. Thank you. Any questions? Yo. Uh, what's about the decision to change from um, fake lighting and, and uh, that kind of thing to PBR? Uh, PBR is it's it's uh, started to come in a bit inevitable as far as um, processes. Uh, everything's changing. I think it was the uh, the programmers uh, pretty much lo looking at the direction of Unity, uh, particularly with uh, Unity five coming. You know, having um, uh, PBR so. It, it, it was very sudden. It did take a while to uh, integrate into that because uh, <laughs> as an artist, you, you're trying to push it, but with PBR, there are distinct rules. Like I, I started off by having like a lot of baked lighting because I was just like, oh, you know, it'll look better with a bit, you know, a bit of uh, darkening under areas and it just ends up looking really grimy and muddy and just uh, not working. So you really have to go very flat with your colors, uh, which is a bit daunting because, um, uh, a lot of stylized characters have a, have a lot of um, different colors to kind of really bring out their their details. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Just because I thought flat's a good environment, I'll just compare it to artists before. Because that's a bit of a muddy silly question. But have you? Is there any point where it gets a low detail enough that you'll flip the face and the texture? Um. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, we ha we haven't really had too much uh, conflict with the, the character in that. Um, it's it's mo more so about uh, uh, just making the textures all, all work. Because um, I, I find it very easy when I'm doing my homework uh, to have, you know, I'm creating my own lighting, so I can create my characters to that lighting. Uh, but when you're working with something else, you have to do it to their, how they've made it. Um, and it's just... It, once you've created the character, just making sure you see it in the environment and just doing some small tweaking. It's usually uh, not too much because uh, Substance Paint is very good for um, converting to Unity. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. Um, and so if you can get a good result in Substance Painter, you know that it's just going to take a little bit of tweaking, usually just a little bit of brightness because uh, in uh, PBR, brightness kind of affects color. It's not really... You know, you can make it a little bit brighter and everything will end up richer as opposed to just, you know, washed out. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, when you're um, setting things up for and stuff, and uh, you're trying to find like, materials or whatever, are you generating masks in ZBrush? Um, I poly paint everything in ZBrush, so I literally just give everything a flat color um, and it's assigned to the, uh, the, like, I think it's assigned to the, vert IDs or something like that, but it's essentially just coloring it in um, ZBrush and exporting it directly out. Uh, but all it, all it is is a texture map of uh, all your regions with a flat color. So it doesn't really matter how you make it as long as everything's uh, separated into flat colors. And you do need to make sure that um, uh, the colors aren't too similar, because when you're color picking, you can accidentally uh, it'll have a percentage rating and you could be picking other regions of your um, character and then be changing their materials without re uh, realizing it. Like I've had a problem uh, many times where I've accidentally been giving my guy like metallic skin or something like that because uh, I didn't realize I was picking, uh, the, the color picking was um, drawing that material out ID as well. Um, it's definitely being uh, done through the sculpting and modeling. I'd say as far as the stylization through color, I want to find that way, but I, I pretty much need to talk to the graphics programmers and, and figure that out. That's something I'm still trying to, to, to uh, get right because um, the way I would say it, I'll, I'll just go through some of these pictures. Um, the way I would say it is that it's very realistic texturing on a stylized, uh, oops, sorry. It's very realistic texturing on a stylized base. 
but it, it would be ideal if it was uh, both. I'm just not sure yet how to do that. Um, Hanafe one on the other hand had stylized textures and stylized shape, um, and we could bring out like edge highlights and stuff. Uh, we are experimenting a bit with um, some edge highlights to try and bring out that stylization, but we'll have to see how that goes um, with the whole PBR process. Anybody else? Yep. Uh, you, you don't have baked lighting in PBR. Everything's very, very flat. Yeah. Uh, it's all driven by the light. So if you have a light that's flat, your character's go not going to have any detail. Um, that, that's, for that reason, your lighting uh, has to work with your textures. It's, it's, it's all kind of combined. It's, it's your lighting um, and the textures in working in unison. Um, but yeah, no shadows or highlights really whatsoever in the textures. That's why I'll actually uh, I'll go to that um, the one texture sheet I showed you for the thieves, um, and that should show you the what you can expect from the textures. So yeah, you can see I have dark eyes there, but that is dark color, not shadow. Um, it's kind of like you know if someone's got dark rings around their eyes, um, and then you can see with everything else, there's no uh, indication of any of the folds or anything like that. It's all uh, flat. Any other questions? Uh, no, we, we did the kind of triangle, um, that that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, that I think it's a bit different be between the um, characters, but. Uh, no, I think that was personal preference. Uh, I don't think there was, it was, we didn't want to go full T-pose just because it, it can affect the, the shoulder shapes. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's almost like the animator then sculpts your shol the shoulders and that can have quite a different effect than what you were aiming for. Yes. So Painter automatically uh, stretches out all the textures to the, to the rest of it, which is really good so you don't have seam lines. So, I mean, you mentioned how kind of lighting affects the color. Did you do any kind of previews for your characters? Like, how did you go with, I suppose, adjusting color and seeing that in game and looking at all this instructions? Um, we had a lot of struggle in the early stages of the game because the lighting for the levels wasn't figured out. And pretty much whatever environment you put the characters in, it would always look a little different. Um, and the idea behind PBR is you, you get your materials, they all have uh, you know, mathematic values, and then it should work for every lighting environment, as long as that lighting environment is also, uh, also has the right values. Um, so uh, it was a struggle until we got our environment lighting sorted. And then we had like three or four lighting setups and we could just compare it within those scopes. So it was a bit messy to begin with, but we, we've, uh, we've started to get that <coughs> sorted out. Yeah. How does the switch uh, from doing uh, defined single characters to the modules or the base characters and outfits, has that affected your workflow? Like, has it been restricted or anything? Or it... um, no, it's, it's, it's pretty... Good because uh, I, I just it's it's efficient. Um, you, you you are thinking about the big picture, so and also because I'm working so specifically to someone else's concept, I, I don't have to be too attached to it. And that's also what's helped me with uh, developing a uh, succinct uh, time frame is knowing the limitations. Like I'm not going to then go further and start changing things. Um, you know, in my own home work, I can you know spend days just noodling with a design um, and it, it's a positive negative uh, thing but it, it's efficient so there's that yeah. hey. in those uh, three quarter views you're getting from the concept artist yeah uh, are you sort of given creative license to say the backs of the feet or are they sort of included in there um, uh, I wouldn't say it's creative license. It's more so just interpreting from the design. Like, I don't create something uh, exactly new from it. Um, I just see, look there and I just imagine what it would be like uh, from there. And usually it just comes with, with uh, you know, after doing it for a while, just uh, 
creating that basic shape. Uh, if I do have any questions, I sit right next to the concept artist and it's usually just a really quick full, what do you think of this? Um, but I, I really don't uh, tend to, to make up too, too much um, unless there's uh, space given for that. Um, any kind of organic uh, part is usually where I tend to uh, add my own flair. Uh, but that's usually, you know, <coughs> tertiary details as opposed to like the main details, you know, creating like interesting veins and muscle shapes and, and such. Um, yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Hey. Can you speak about how you do your hair? <laughs> um, I, I usually don't have my hair like this, but I usually get a ton of gel and just go through it, and then I, <laughs> and then I comb it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I'll be honest, I was actually leaving character. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it's a lot of sculpting hairstyle. Yeah. Know about you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, the hair, to be honest, I change it a bit per character. Um, I do also keep it to the concept, um, as you can see between these ones. Um, I do it kind of the way, same way I do that helmets, in the sense that I'll paint on the shape and then extract it out and then shape it from there. But what I do try to pay attention to is where I'm going to build the low poly. So. With this guy, you can obviously, he's got those little spikes and you've really just got to figure out how few sp spikes you can create um, before it's going to start uh, being too uh, high poly. Um, one of the other things is uh, long hair. It's a bit tricky in this style because it's essentially clay-like and ha having long hair ends up being like a like big clump, you know. So I try to avoid it for the most part or do things like ponytails and, and things like that. Uh, but the hair is very uh, different per character. Um, we also don't have, now that I think about it, we don't have too much hair uh, because uh, a lot of the characters have helmets and or have, you know, short, short military hairstyles. Anyone else? Hey. Um, well, I shouldn't talk too much about that, um, <laughs> but uh, no, as, as far as creating, uh, no, not, not really, <laughs> I, 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 should, I should say. What we do try to do is, um, if we are to have multiple uh, armors, I'd say we would uh, keep uh, parts that we can try and copy across both. So anything that bends too much, we'll try to avoid that. But anything we can just copy and paste from one model to the next. Like if you have, uh, I'm trying to find an example, um, like, a, like a buckle or something, you could always just copy that from the one model to the next. Um, but having anything that's too form fitting, um, you probably try to avoid. Oh, hey. Um, this might be a question for the class with PAs, but um, how do you set up your modular costume image to switch in and out of characters? Um, I'm not actually too sure. <laughs> Pretty much, I, I just got to make sure they've uh, got the right proportions on, on the character. Um, yeah, I, I can't really talk, talk to that. Uh, Yes, yes, they are skin the separate objects. But I, I know that they can often transfer what they have as a base because they're all roughly in the same place. Um, having like a quick skin uh, is very good for, for any demonstrations. Like if, if we're going to say, hey, let's create the most dramatic armor we can have, um, you know, the biggest armor we can have, uh, I, can, I can send them a model and they can have it animating like almost immediately just by doing a direct skin. But then it would take like a little bit more extra time to then paint weights. Uh, specifically for that uh, design. Yep. Um, so, I don't know how to say it has skeleton shapes of human, but they all have the same skeleton, or do you have specific skeletons for each, like, the phenotype of the body? Uh, yeah, we have different ones for, for each of those. Um, but like, like I showed you with the thief, um, we kind of just all build them from one from the, from the next, you know, uh, with this one. Um, yeah, 
the thing is, even the uh, different body types that we did create, uh, we just took like a model like this and just made it bigger um, and, and changed the proportions. So everything, we never create anything from completely from scratch. Uh, and that's just worked pretty effectively for us so far. I mean, even in my uh, home time, I'll, I'll do that as, as much as uh, possible. If I, if I need to work from my hand, I'll see if I've got a hand that's close enough to what I'm doing, unless I uh, specifically am trying to build uh, skills. Because sometimes you just want to get something done, and sometimes you, you're trying to learn. Yeah. Hi. For your own personal work, do you prefer baked fighting or PBR? Um, I do PBR now. I used to like. I used to really like uh, baked lighting, but it just feels like it's fading out. So, uh, as a as a result, yeah, I try to keep it uh, PBR. Also, because the, there's there's a lot to PBRs. Uh, there's a lot of simple rules, but there's also a lot of subtle nuances uh, to get it right. And it's, it's a combination of lighting and the textures. So uh, I want to spend as much time doing that just so I can be uh, you know, completely integrated uh, into that process. Yep. Anybody? <laughs> Yeah. Question. Uh, since we're talking about PBR, how do you feel a game like Overwatch handles stylized PBR compared to your hand of fate, which is similarly stylized but more realistic? Yeah, um, I love Overwatch. <laughs> I think it's got a great stylized uh, approach. Um, but our, our whole texturing process has been based on realism. Uh, the, the characters are a little different in the sense that they are stylized, um, but the biggest difference in that is that we have a lot of grain and detail in our textures, whilst uh, Overwatch is very uh, flat, very painterly. But then again, so are the environments. Every aspect of that game is following the same style. Um, so we have it different in that sense of that realism. And uh, if we were to create that, it would have to be characters. The characters would be much, much flatter. And then the environments would have to be working in unison. Um, it's kind of like these, uh, it's almost just like if I had it like this and then started highlighting edges, that's, that would be a closer approach. Um, if, also, if you ignore the, the colors on the face and the hands, everything would be much more uh, subdued. So it's, it's a bit more, um, yeah, it's just more ground up, stylized. You said that you'd highlight the edges, but before you were saying that you shouldn't highlight anything in the video. Uh, yeah, that, that is because it's for the stylized stuff, and that's also a hand-painted uh, approach. But for the realistic process, you, you wouldn't do it because it just ends up having looking really grungy. Right. Uh, you were saying before that you uh, don't feel like you have to spend that much detail with the hard surface stuff. Yeah. What, what, like, what is the extent of the detail that you put into the skull? Okay. Um, when it comes to hard surface areas, I pretty much leave it like that. Um, completely, I try to make it as clean and pristine as possible, uh, unless it has a, a distinct character marks. And by that, I mean like a massive dent or big scratch or anything. And the reason is, uh, in Hand of Fate 1, I would actually sculpt my leather patterns. I would sculpt the metal scratches and everything. And then when I would do the baked lighting, they would come out in shadows and would give the effect of the metal. But uh, using Substance Painter now, they have lots of tiled height maps and details and metals and such. And uh, if you layer them up, it ends up looking really grungy. Um, but uh, one of the other processes that we can do uh, is height maps are black and white maps, and they're tiled. So uh, essentially, if we wanted to make a lot of character in our sculpting, what we should do is uh, create, create it and then bake it create the, um, the pattern and then bake it out and turn that into a tiled map and then apply it in substance still as opposed to doing it as a process that we apply to the materials. Because when I was doing it in Hand of Fate 1, I would, uh, for, for metal, for example, I'd do like three different passes of like kind of like weathering to give it the effect of metal. But you, we could condense that into a, you know, map-based formula because I'm doing the same thing every time. Does that answer the question? Cool. Hey. Uh, when making your, like when you have your base model and then you have your different variants, 
would you then create variants of the variants that makes sense? Like you say for the Molotov thing, would you say have a hat that might have a cut in it or something like that to add more variants, or would you sort of keep it as modular as possible? Um, no, we'd probably keep it modular. If we're going to make a variation, we're more likely to make a whole character, whole other version of it than to make to edit that one version. Um, yeah. Uh, and the thieves are kind of have been designed in a way that we can uh, mix and match. We're not sure if we're going to do that yet. You know, give one guy one hat, one guy a different jacket. You know, we could swap it out like that. Don't know if we're going to do that just because everything's already been established as single. Uh, whole uh, characters. Hey. Um, what sort of role do outsourcers, outsourcing play in the pipeline? Um, we haven't had too much of it, but when we have had it, we've always had a, a relation with them uh, in house beforehand. But we have had them uh, create uh, characters and such, and usually um, that'll involve me making kind of like a base and giving that to them, and then them working over that. So it would be me giving them a character and them giving that character an armor or something. So I try to give them um, something to build upon and something to integrate into, as opposed to giving something somebody the work on their own. Because uh, then there's so many different subtle things that end up uh, getting lost. Um, and it takes a lot of conversation uh, to really get somebody in the headspace. You kind of have to address it as though you've never heard of it before because you always have your own predisposition and things that you focus on um, when you when you uh, address something. So you've got to act like you don't think that way when you when you create the documents to send to somebody. And that's just when you don't have bandwidth to do something that you... Uh, uh, so as to why we do it? Um, yeah. When... Uh, I, I don't make that call. Usually it's the art director, um, and that has been um, if, if they don't think we're going to hit a deadline. And that, that's usually months in advance of a deadline. So, yep. But we also haven't, we haven't had an abundance uh, of it, but where, where we have had it, I've, I've never really felt uh, overburdened in work, so they're clearly doing it at the right times. So looking at amounts of the feet that you show, how are you setting those up? Or like, are you just doing on the face? Are you just doing the mouse open so an animator can read that, or is it, are you like is it going to be left like that? Um, the mouths. Yeah. The, were they open? All oh, right. Yeah. So um, with the main characters, I'll tend to uh, have a lot more detail, and I'll have their mouths closed. Um, and then I'll extract like a mouth cavity afterwards. That's because they're more specific and they might uh, need more um, uh, specific animations. And the reason I keep the mouth closed is I feel like the closed mouth is, is a really important shape. And I don't want to leave that to the animators to kind of construct that shape when they close the mouth. So I'd rather create a couple of blend shapes as expressions to, to starting with the mouth closed and then opening that up. Um, as for the generic enemies like this, I keep it uh, the mouth open so that it's because it's much more basic expressions that are going to come through. Um, and it does take a bit of work to uh, kind of like extract the mouth from the closed expression and such. Do you uh, use substance designer much for when uh, you don't have a material that you need? Uh, no. <laughs> No, we, we, have, we have a graphics programmer, and he, he's uh, covering our uh, material needs pretty effectively. Um, but, yeah, we, we're still experimenting with that, uh, particularly with things like skin. Um, but that's something that's constantly in refinement for, for the characters and how they uh, react to light and such. Uh, particularly creatures, uh, characters like uh, the Corrupted, um, they need some kind of special... These are the corrupted, these kind of uh, ghoulish characters that they require a bit more, uh, some interesting um, materials. And usually the approach to any kind of unique materials is to get a material ID, like I had for the textures, and just make sure to assign something specific to those regions that will require the different uh, approach. Um, so here he's got like a semi-translucent glow within his hammer, but then the rest of his body is pretty standard. Uh, and then also have... 
um, something written so that the uh, alpha cards, those characters have alpha cards, um, so that's done done well. Yeah. What's your favorite brush? Your brush? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, let me see. I mean, Dam uh, use the yeah, Damien standard. Yeah. Who doesn't like that? <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. So you've been working on Hand of Fame for a while now. Uh, without probing for too much information, do you find that your personal work sort of quenched uh, your progression into other fields? Like, as you said, um, hard surface design and stuff. Do you find that if you're not getting a lot of work in hard surface design, that you try and keep up the date in that field? Or? Um, yeah, so Hand of Fame is a very specific style of its own. So. Um, at home, I pretty much try to do as much of anything else <laughs> um, as, as possible. So if I show my own stuff, um, yeah, I do a lot of realistic. Uh, everything's like this was an experimentation with ZBrush fiber mesh. Um, you know, they're kind of like fur effects. Uh, this is just trying to create a, you know, I think that was one of the first realistic characters I did. Um, this was creating something that was more stylized, much more to the extreme than what Hand of Fate was. Um, this is, again was uh, realistic. This is based on the order after that came out. Um, this was a key shot render because I hadn't really done that before. Uh, this is kind of like an, I wanted to tell like a story through an artwork. And I created this for some friends that were um, still struggling with their own um, skills and trying to get into the industry. So I did that. All right. Hey. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but for Hand of Fate, what do you use for rigging and faking? And I know you use CC Yeah, uh, we use X normal, or I used to use X normal for my baking. Um, I now do substance painter. I still sometimes jump back to X normal, just depending on the process. Uh, it's all about having a uh, a good cage. Um, in an ideal world, I would create uh, all my models in a scale that would be best for baking. Um, but unfortunately, with ZBrush, there's a lot of things that relate to scale, um, and as a result, the I end up going through multiple scales throughout the process, which is which is a bit tricky. And unfortunately, occasionally I'll send like the animators a character that's a thousand feet tall, uh, <laughs> and then I'll have to you know go back and, and change that. Yeah. I was just wondering if, uh, if you need any special tools in your character pipeline that would like improve your workflow or speed of your work. Uh, what what kind of tools are you talking about? Yeah, um, I keep everything pretty, pretty like standard. As in, you know, I use ZBrush for almost all the sculpting. I use Topogun for the um, low poly models and my hard surface stuff. I use Maya for the low poly stuff again, um, and the hard surface stuff. Uh, and also, I do my UV optimization in it. So uh, I don't use any auto. UV layout, I kind of uh, create all my UVs and then I'll manually do it just because I really like the optimization because uh, that can be pretty uh, substantial, the amount of space you can save by like having only one leg, for example, and mirroring it across. And the same with uh, any, any, uh, any objects with thickness, making sure the other side is, is hidden. Like if you have a belt buckle, the side that's facing the character is, is got really low uh, UVs because it might not be worth deleting the geometry, but you still want to save that space in the UVs. Um, and then for texturing, it's all in um, Substance Painter. So it's all pretty, uh, you know, compartmentalized. I'm not using any uh, fancy plugins or anything like that, unless you're considering ZBrush, but then that has, the only plugins I use for that are the, uh, the plugins that are with the program. So I'm not, I don't have uh, any online. Occasionally I'll find brushes, um, but that's usually specific to the character that I'm doing. So every character is unique and you really kind of, you need to address the concept and realize what tools you need to make to do that. Like for example, uh, I'll show you the, um, these guys, well, not those ones, these are 
corrupted guys. They've, got, they've all got this rocky corruption shape. And I literally uh, sculpted like a couple rocks uh, and then created a couple different brushes from that and then used that as a stamping brush. And now every time I need to create a corrupted character, they're actually really quick because all I need to do is have, uh, you know, organic uh, body and then just stamp the, the rocks everywhere and then create a couple of rocks that will have, um, you know, character to them that will create a foundation for the rest of it. But other than that, all the, the details are just through a stamp that I made myself. All right.